Welcome to episode 106 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to Ed Peterson, who served with the FBI for 27 years. In this episode, he reviews the investigation of the kidnapping and murder of Exxon Oil Executive Sidney Riso. While the FBI and local law enforcement negotiated for his release, what the investigators didn't know was that Riso had been shot in the arm during the kidnapping and died three days later. During his career, Ed Peterson, in addition to working a variety of investigations, was also a certified hostage negotiator, a police instructor, and SWAT team coordinator. He also served as the FBI's liaison for state, local, and federal law enforcement agencies and with professional sports teams. After retiring from the FBI, Ed Peterson became the director of security for Major League Baseball in the office of the commissioner. Currently, he is co-founder of Buckley Peterson Global Inc. and contributes to security assessments, and the development of crisis readiness and response plans for corporations, schools, hospitals, and professional sports. This is an unbelievable interview. I'm so glad I was able to locate Ed Peterson and that he agreed to do the interview. Before we get to the interview, there's just a few things that I want to remind you about. First of all, that DC podcast meetup is March 18th. I'll be hanging out with Esther from Once Upon a Crime, Deanna from Twisted Philly, and Haley from Murder Road Trip. March 18th at Busboys and Poets at 5th and K in Washington, D.C. from 2 to 5. Stop by and say hello. The other thing I want to say is thank you for all of you who email me and tweet me and leave comments on my Facebook page. I so enjoy hearing from you. Many of you want to know if I have a Patreon account or why I don't do ads. That's because I'm a crime fiction writer. And if you want to support me, you can do so by picking up a copy of my book, Pay to Play, as an ebook, trade paperback, or audiobook at Amazon.com. My second novel, Greedy Givers, will be out in June. So if you want to show support for the show and for me, you can pick up a copy of Pay to Play for yourself or someone you know who loves crime fiction. Another way you can support me is by joining my FBI and Books, TV and Movie Reader Team, where once a month I send out an email digest of the previous month's podcast episodes, my crime fiction recommendation, I also keep you up to date on new books, TV shows, and movies about the FBI. And lately, I've been doing something that's been really fun for me, watching a movie and letting you know about the cliches and misconceptions that I found, you know, what they got right, what they got wrong about the FBI. When you join the reader team, you also get the FBI reading resource, which is a list of all of the books, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs that have been featured on FBI Retired Case File Review. These are books that were written by the agents who have been interviewed on the podcast. You can sign up for my reader team on my website, jerrywilliams.com, or my Facebook page, Jerry Williams Author. And the last way you can support me, show me some love, is to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. And if you really are enjoying them, you can always leave a review for the podcast and pay to play. So thank you. Now here's the interview. I am excited to introduce my guest for today, Ed Peterson. Hi, Ed. Hi, Jerry. How are you? I'm great. So I have to give producer credit to listener Mark Mondo. He sent me an email, let me know he was listening to the show and that he enjoyed it and said that he grew up in North New Jersey, in North Jersey, as we call it, and told me about this case, which I remembered hearing about not only in the news at the time, 
but it was also mentioned in an episode that I did on a kidnapping in Silicon Valley. He wanted me to have somebody come on to talk about this case. This case was considered the nation's third largest kidnapping case. The only two that were bigger were the Lindbergh baby kidnapping and Patty Hearst. So I'm sure there's a lot of twists and turns and exciting things that you're going to tell us about today, so I can't wait to get started. Where do you want to start? Well, I I think uh, the best way to do it would be to put together a timeline and outline the key uh, factors of the kidnapping. Sidney Riso was the victim. He was the president of Exxon International, had a great reputation in that capacity, uh, was very active in his community with with his church. Uh, He and his wife were both big fundraisers. I'll get into why he was uh, uh, selected to to be the target of this kidnapping uh, shortly. The kidnapping took place on uh, April 29th, 1992. It was the third largest kidnapping uh, um, following the Lindbergh and Patty Hearst cases, but it was the largest of any kidnapping as far as the ransom demand, which was $18.5 million. That was the largest uh, ransom demand in the history of any kidnapping. Did he and, have it? Pardon me? Did Sidney Russo have that type of money? Well, no. Uh, Exxon had the kind of money. And the kidnappers, uh, they did their homework, Jerry. They had researched a kidnapping where Exxon once paid for the release of one of their executives. His name was Victor Samuelson. And Victor Samuelson was the kidnapping victim of a terrorist group in Argentina. And the kidnappers knew, they had researched it, and they knew that Exxon paid $14.2 million for the release of Victor Samuelson by the uh, terrorist group in Argentina. So they had the the sense in their mind that Exxon might be willing to pay that kind of ransom money. So I think uh, uh, they were motivated by greed. And I'll get into a little bit of a profile of the kidnappers. But this kidnapping uh, lasted 52 days, which was a tremendous ordeal, certainly on the family. Mrs. Riso, a wonderful woman, and her four children, uh, couldn't have been more cooperative, and we had a great working relationship with the uh, Morris County uh, Prosecutor's Office, Morris Township Police Department, the Sheriff's Office. It was a great team effort. Manpower-wise, we had as many as 250, 300 FBI agents and law enforcement officers uh, involved in uh, helping with the kidnapping investigation. So it was a very large-scale case. My specific role, I was asked to assume the identity of one of the Exxon executives who was in charge of of their public uh, relations, public information officer. I had met with him and got a profile of his background in case they asked me any questions about him. And what I'll do is uh, I'll I'll take you through uh, what happened actually with the, uh, the kidnapping itself. The first question that might be asked was, why Sidney Riso? And there were a lot of lessons learned for uh, uh, corporations. We had, after the subsequent to the kidnapping and the arrest of the kidnapping kidnappers, we had uh, been asked to speak with several uh, major corporations and and in the law enforcement community. And the reason we found out when we got the confession from one of the kidnappers why they targeted Sidney Riso was accessibility. The location of his home, it was easy to surveil. His position as president of Exxon International, and he was a creature of habit. That was one of the biggest things. At 7.25 every morning, when he wasn't being picked up, if he was traveling internationally, he'd be picked up by a limousine uh, at his residence and, and taken to the airport or wherever he had to go. But when he wasn't, he elected to drive himself to work, which was about 10 minutes from his home in Morris Township. He would routinely, uh, his car would emerge out of this winding driveway at around 7.25 a.m. The first thing he would do would get out of his car, 
to pick up the daily newspaper and get back into his car and head off to work. Well, the kidnappers, they had looked at a number of Exxon executives and they made that decision that Sidney Riso was probably the easiest target, the most accessible. And they did their planning uh, back in December of uh, 1991, and they didn't actually execute the kidnapping until April 29th of 92. They had conducted numerous surveillances of uh, of his residence. Both of them had posed as joggers. Uh, he had lived in a uh, in kind of a cul-de-sac, kind of a private uh, road. But they posed as joggers to get a good uh, idea of his routine. Uh, they had rented vans, and they had obtained a storage facility in uh, Washington Township, which was approximately five miles from their residence in Lebanon Township, where the kidnappers actually lived. Off the seal, with the help of his wife, built a wooden box, and, and this wooden box was designed to hold Sidney Riso captive inside this storage facility. The wooden box was six feet long, three and a half feet high, three feet wide. It had air holes throughout the uh, the box to allow uh, Sidney Riso to breathe. And the top of the box was attached with hinges. It had three padlocks on it and eye bolts fastened to the inside of the box and it was constructed with heavy plywood, three-quarter-inch plywood, and two-by-fours. It sounds like a coffin. Yes, it, it, it does. And that's they, that, and actually, Jerry, that's what it turned out to be. It, it's interesting when you, um, uh, when you hear about the letter that they wrote and the prophecy of this letter, uh, it really uh, strikes home that exactly – what they threatened was going to happen to Sidney Riso did, in fact, happen to him. Mm. So uh, the day of the kidnapping, uh, Wednesday, April 29th, 1992, at 7.25 a.m., Jackie Seals, she was the wife of Arthur Seals. They were the kidnappers. And I'll get into their background shortly. But uh, Jackie Seals, in a, in a jogging suit, a very attractive, uh, blonde head, actually a school teacher, very well-educated, and she posed as a jogger, and that morning she jogged past Sidney Riso's home. And what she did was she kicked the newspaper about eight to ten feet away from the driveway, which would cause Sidney Riso, when he got out of his vehicle, to go the extra distance to retrieve the newspaper. She got back to meet with Officer Seals. They had ski masks, and they were in a rented van. And at 7.25, when Sidney Riso arrived at the top of his driveway, he got out of the vehicle. Jackie Seals was driving. She was wearing a ski mask, and uh, as was Arthur Seal. And uh, they immediately swooped down on Sidney Riso. Unexpectedly, uh, they, uh, Arthur Seal was out of the van with an automatic handgun pointed at Sidney Riso. And Sidney Riso immediately complied with the demands of Arthur Seal. Arthur Seal told him, don't make a sound, get into the van. The side door of the van was open. And uh, Sidney Riso uh, did exactly what he said. But what happened as he approached the, uh, the side of the van, which was open, he realized that Arthur Seal was going to put him into uh, this wooden box. And he just freaked out, and a struggle ensued. Uh, the weapon went off, and it shot Sidney Riso through the forearm. It didn't hit any vital organs. It just shot him through the forearm, but it was enough for Arthur Seal to overpower him, force him into the, uh, into the box. They duct-taped his mouth, and they duct-taped his eyes, and they uh, duct-taped his hands together, and uh, he, he was stuck in that box with padlocks uh, closed. They drove to a nearby park, Morris Lewis Park, and they changed the license plates. They had phony license plates on the van uh, held on with clips. 
they changed the license plates, and they headed for the storage facility in Washington Township. They backed the van into the storage facility, and Jackie Seals assisted Arthur as they took the wooden box out of the back of the van. And then they closed the doors of the shed when they moved the van outside it. And they uh, told the Sidney Riso they wanted him to make a recording. He begged them. They took the duct tape off his mouth. And he begged them to uh, take the duct tape off his eyes and that he would cooperate fully. He would do whatever they asked him to do. But they refused to do that. And he begged them not to put him back in the wooden box. Uh, by this time, his arm from the gunshot wound had swelled up. And they had uh, stopped on the way at a ShopRite pharmacy, and they picked up bottled water, a gauze uh, to treat the wound superficially, and Tylenol for pain. And they gave him the Tylenol, they gave him some water, and they treated the wound superficially. They cut off his suit jacket, the sleeve of his suit jacket, and they uh, removed his uh, Rolex watch, and they proceeded after they had him make a uh, tape you know, about their demands that, you know, he asked Exxon to follow their demands. And then they uh, tied him up, put him back in the box, and uh, closed the box. And unfortunately for Sidney Riso, if you were to check the weather on that particular time, from April 29th to uh, May 3rd, the day he actually died inside the box, the weather had been close to 90 degrees. So when you stop and think about it, Sidney Riso laid in a wooden box. They made no provisions for him to relieve himself, so he laid in that wooden box in his own urine and excrement. And the temperature inside an aluminum shed inside a wooden box had to be close to 100 degrees, I would assume. Of course, outside, the weather was close to 90 uh, during that time frame. What is amazing about what you just told us is that you also said that they spent so much time planning this. You would think that they would have had the sense to know that no one could survive in those conditions. I mean, not only that, Sidney Riso had a, uh, it was well publicized that he had a heart condition. So what happened uh, they would check the box about three times a day. And, the uh, again, the only thing that they gave them, they would open the box, they would check on him, and they would uh, check the wound. Uh, they would give him water, some lemon, water with lemon. But they gave him nothing to eat. And when I got the confession from Jackie Seal, she told me the reason they gave him nothing to eat is because they didn't have any provisions for him to relieve himself. It was inhumane the way this man was held in captivity in that wooden box, not knowing what his fate would be. They proceeded to uh, follow up on the ransom demand. And the, and the way they did that, it, it was very interesting. After Sidney Riso was kidnapped, we, first of all, when he, was, uh, when he disappeared, we didn't know what to expect. We were called, uh, the FBI was called by the uh, Morris County Prosecutor's Office, we had a very good working relationship in the Morris Township Police Department, and we arrived immediately on the scene shortly after the disappearance of the uh, of, of Sidney Riso. And uh, what happened was his car was at the top of the driveway running. The vehicle was left running at the top of Sidney Riso's driveway. Of the car door of the driver's side was left open. And across the road from where Sidney Riso lived was the uh, uh, was another executive from Exxon. Uh, his wife had just happened to look out the window, and she saw the car door open, running, but she didn't see Sidney Riso. And she looked at it, and she thought that was suspicious. So she called Mrs. Riso, and she said, is everything all right with Sid? His car is at the top of the driveway running, and the car door is open. And Mrs. Riso had just come out of the shower. She immediately went uh, 
up the drive. We got dressed, went up and looked and realized. And, you know, she called for her husband. She looked for her husband. And she immediately knew something was wrong because he had been gone already about 20, 25 minutes, 7.25 a.m. And at the, the time that the neighbor spotted his car running with the car door open, it was about 20 minutes later. And Mrs. Rizzo knew something was wrong. So uh, she immediately called the police. They responded and they uh, uh, scoured the area. They they spread out and checked the whole surrounding area because they lived in a wooded area. It was a, a very uh, uh, rural type area. And they uh, looked all throughout the woods uh, knowing that uh, his wife said he had a heart condition and they were wondering maybe he felt sick and was disoriented and wandered away. And then, of course, as far as the investigation is concerned, we had to profile Sidney Riso. You don't know whether he had financial issues or if he was involved with another woman, why he would disappear. But Sidney Riso had such a great reputation that we quickly dismissed any of those possibilities and the distinct possibility of a kidnapping uh, emerged. A phone call was received the following day at Exxon headquarters, and they also mailed Sidney Riso's credit card to Exxon to validate the fact that they had him. And they said that a letter could be found and they described the exact location taped to one of the utility poles at the Livingston Mall, and they gave very specific directions. And we retrieved that letter, and the letter was very interesting because the letter really portrayed itself as Sidney Riso being the victim of an environmental terrorist group. And um, I'll just quote one section of the uh, letter, which I think is very important. Mr. Riso will be held in total isolation with no food or water. If you do not fully comply, he will most certainly die. We have observed and developed information on many of your personnel. If we do not hear from you, we will seize another of your employees the letter was signed by the Fernando Pereira Brigade, Warriors of the Rainbow. And the significance of that was that was a, a group that was part of uh, a um, of Greenpeace. Uh, there was a big protest. And the original uh, information came in 1985, uh, the French government, Frogmen, they were French government agents attempting to prevent uh, Greenpeace, uh, who was obstructing a nuclear testing site. They blew up the Greenpeace ship, and the name of that ship was called the Rainbow Warrior, and it was in Auckland, New Zealand. And there was a tremendous, um, you know, Greenpeace, uh, members of Greenpeace vowed retaliation, and again, this was on the heels of the Exxon Valdez with the, uh, when they had that tremendous oil uh, leakage, uh, and, uh, with that uh, Exxon Valdez ship. So at first it looked like very plausible that this could be an echo terrorist group. But soon, in working with the FBI Behavioral Science Unit, we realized that we were not dealing with an echo terrorist group. We were probably dealing with local criminals because all the phone calls that we were able to trap from pay phones that they used were all in the Morris, Essex County area, the northern New Jersey area. And there was no indication of, even though the letter alluded to this big international group that they were going to hold them uh, in Brazil and his dead body would be exposed at some a rally in Brazil, you know, all this was just uh, uh, made up rhetoric. Uh, the fact of the matter, the kidnapping was perpetrated by two individuals, one of whom 
we found out uh, later in the investigation, actually had worked for Exxon. And and that's one of, as uh, you know, Jerry, that's one of the first things that we do in any kidnapping um, case, especially if it's related to anything uh, with a corporation or company. We look at disgruntled employees, and we went through a tremendous list of employees who had left Exxon for whatever reasons uh, we interviewed. Uh, no interviews were done telephonically. We interviewed people face-to-face, and we made sure that we didn't miss, we didn't leave any stones uncovered. But but, but you were only interviewing people that were currently working, or were you no, also interviewing people that had left? No, we interviewed people who were terminated from their employment, uh, you know, going back even a few years. And all of the leads, uh, leads were computerized. Every lead uh, that we looked at, it was computerized and followed up and indexed. Any disgruntled employee, any people who had an axe to grind with Exxon, Sidney Riso had a great reputation amongst his employees. He was very well liked and respected. So we just couldn't figure that out. When we arrested the kidnappers, uh, Arthur and Jackie Seal, and found out that Arthur had been an employee of Exxon, you know, we went back and looked, you know, why didn't he come up on the radar? And the reason being, he really wasn't considered a disgruntled employee. He was hired from a, a police department. He worked for the Hillside, New Jersey Police Department. And Exxon really didn't do a great uh, background investigation on him. Of course, had they done a, a, a good background investigation, they would have found that this guy had a history of uh, police brutality and he had a very bad reputation as a police officer. And he went out early on a disability. His gun went off, he claimed, accidentally and shot himself in the foot and and he left uh, with a, a settlement with his uh, pension. And he opened up, he and his wife opened up a private furniture business. And meanwhile, he was hired by Exxon in the security department. And he didn't really have a good uh, reputa- reputation at Exxon, but he didn't have a, a reputation that would qualify him as someone that they would suspect in a kidnapping. What happened was he was working with Exxon, and he eventually left Exxon with his wife. They had these uh, illusions of grandeur that their furniture business could really grow. And they left and they moved to South Carolina. And they uh, opened up a furniture business in South Carolina. And again, the, these were two people that did a lot of planning, but they could never, ever finish what they did. And they did not a very good job. They had took, taken over a successful furniture business. And Hilton Head, they immediately went out. They bought matching Mercedes. They bought a, a 35-foot sailboat. They had plans to sail around the world. Uh, they joined the, uh, one of the richest country clubs down there. And soon after, their furniture business went under. Mm-hmm. And they owed tremendous amounts of money. Their boat was seized. Uh, their uh, cars were seized. Uh, their business went under. And they wound up moving to Vail, Colorado, uh, where uh, he got another job. And that didn't work out. And the next thing you knew, the apartment, the house that they were living in, the uh, marshals put a lock on the door, and they were they were done with Colorado, and they were relegated to moving back to New Jersey, living in the basement of Arthur Seals' a mother and father's house. And they had two children, a boy and a girl, who went to exclusive prep schools. So they had these bills, these tuitions, and that's where uh, the idea of kidnapping Sidney uh, Riso came up. Arthur Seal came up with that idea that they could get out from all of their problems, uh, knowing that uh, Exxon had once paid $14.2 million for the release of their executive in Argentina. They figured this was their uh, solution. 
Wow. You know, some people definitely have a different way of thinking. You know, you and I would get a second job or find a way to legitimately earn some money to get our family out of debt. And these two decide to kidnap somebody. Yeah. So let me take you through what happens. And this case probably would have been over with within four days. But this this is what transpired. Three days after the kidnapping, they were checking on Arthur, uh, Arthur Seal and, and Irene Seal were checking on Sidney Riso a few times a day to make sure everything was all right. On Sunday morning, May 3rd, Arthur Seal went over to open the box. Jackie Seal uh, went into the corner to get the bottled water and the, and the Tylenol. And she knew something was wrong. She she looked over and she saw Arthur Seal uh, pressing down on Sidney Riso's uh, chest. And she went over immediately and saw that Sidney Riso's color was so pale, almost like a greenish tint, and she knew he was dead. So what they did, the insensitivity of these two, they put plastic wrapping on the floor, like plastic garbage bags on the floor. They removed Sidney Riso from the wooden box. They laid him on the plastic. He took all his clothes off, and Arthur Seal proceeded to put all his clothes in a bag, and he went back home, and he got a, uh, a a chainsaw to cut up the wooden box. They, meantime, rolled up Iriso's body in the plastic with rope, and Arthur Seal bought the uh, cut-up wooden pieces from the box along with the hardware, the lock and the uh, bolts and everything else, the um, hinges, and he put that in a bag, and he proceeded to bring it behind his father's home. Uh, behind the father's home was a wooded area that led to a, 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 a little bit of a, a stream that led to a river. And Arthur Seal threw all the metal, the locks and the hinges, into the water, into the river. And he proceeded to burn the clothing and the wooden box in a clearing several hundred feet from his father's home. And Jackie Seal, this is how insensitive they were, uh, she went home and prepared a dinner for them, and that was the night we were supposed to deliver the money uh, to a location. I was directed to a Italian restaurant in Summit, New Jersey, the Villa Restaurant, and there was a pay phone booth outside the restaurant, and I was to await a phone call from the kidnappers at at the number of, of, of the pay phone, and that they would give me directions. And I was there, and, and we had everything all set up. We would have had them in custody that night, but the phone call never came. And why it never came, we learned later on that Jackie Seal was dyslexic, and she reversed the four last digits of the phone number. So I stood there for hours waiting for that call, and no call ever came. And, and so they were calling some other number wondering why you weren't picking up. Yeah, yeah, they were a short distance away uh, at a location, and they were, to, they were going to give me very specific directions. And if I could back up a little bit, one of their directions, which was very interesting, is they wanted, uh, in the very beginning, they, uh, when we got the letter from them that was retrieved from the Livingston Mall, they wanted us to obtain an ad in the uh, uh, local newspaper, which was a, a big newspaper in New Jersey, in northern New Jersey, called the Star Ledger. And they wanted to, us to place an ad in the newspaper advertising for the sale of a rare international bird and to put a phone number in. And that phone number that was in the ad for the rare international bird, that last four digits of that phone number were to be reversed, and that's how they would reach me. So that's how they established contact with me 
uh, and we had set up the command post at the Riso residence. And I would get calls from the kidnappers on that number with very specific directions. Uh, the one set of directions sent me to uh, that Mar Morris Lewis Park at night. I remember it was a Friday evening. And I walked into the park, and they were af af afraid, that the Bureau was afraid of a possible ambush to retrieve a letter. And they described exactly where the letter would be to walk into the park. The letter would be behind a big white rock. And sure enough, I found the letter with all the directions on the drop of the money. They wanted the $18.5 million ready to go that Sunday night and for me to be at the phone booth at that Italian restaurant in Summit. And it was a, a terrible night for, for the family and everyone when at the end of the night we came back, there was no communication from the kidnappers, and we didn't know what happened. We didn't know what went wrong. And, and that was the worst part, uh, uh, Jerry, because for days and weeks they would not contact anyone and we you know and the family just held out hopes that he was alive but the behavioral science unit had told us they said look they've had every opportunity to uh, do what you asked them we were asking them to send us a photo of Sidney Riso holding up the daily newspaper with the date on it to prove that he was still alive and behavioral science uh, told us you're giving them a hurdle that they can't get over. They said he's probably dead, but we would not be able to say that. We didn't want to say that. We tried to prepare, prepare the family for that possibility, but they, they were so hoping that he was still alive. Yeah, I would think that some proof of life would be a standard in any kidnapping. They weren't able to, to do that for you. No. So let me take you through the final ransom demand. Fifty-two days later, they had indicated, they had reached out to me and indicated that they wanted the uh, ransom paid this particular night. And it was unbelievable. It was like a, a scene from the movie uh, Dirty Harry. Between this time when they're doing this last ransom request, how often were you speaking to them during the last part of this 52-day time period? Well, communications, which one was such an insensitive communication, they wanted Mrs. Riso to appear on TV pleading for her husband's life. Talk about the insensitivity of these people. They had Mrs. Riso go on a national TV begging for the life of her husband, that they'll do anything that needs to be done. All they want is her husband back home safe and sound. That's all they were asking for. And meanwhile, the kidnappers knew he was dead. He was dead uh, three days later. But their greed had propelled them to keep this thing alive and going. So the final ransom demand, they send me to, uh, and they wanted Sidney Riso's daughter, Renee to drive the family vehicle and we had an undercover FBI agent, a female who looked uh, very much like Renee. She had blonde hair. She looked very much uh, as uh, Renee did and she could pass for Renee. So she drove me uh, to the locations where the, uh, the phone booth was and I would get uh, instructions they sent me to a library, and they said, and on the front porch of the library, under a bench, you'll find a letter taped under the bench. And that letter would instruct me to go 2.3 miles to a private school where I would find a letter, the next letter, and uh, there were two uh, bushes at the entrance to the school. On the bush on the left, I would find the letter that would indicate where I would go next. And then they sent me to a place that had really like kind of an abandoned place that had the sand, gravel, and cement. And it was dimly lit. And it was kind of an eerie location. And I went there and awaited the phone call. 
And this is where uh, the uh, surveillance team picked up on the kidnappers. Uh, we had over 200 FBI agents and detectives out covering all the previous locations where phone calls had come in. And I was wired, uh, and the command post could hear me perfectly. And they had the car. We had aerial surveillance up on the car, and everything was done. We had the uh, SWAT team coverage. Everything was in place. And the command post said to all units, to all 200 units, we have an incoming call. Everyone watch your respective locations to see if there's any calls being made simultaneously with the call that's being received by me. And sure enough, an FBI agent, a female FBI agent, in kind of a remote area in a strip mall, she sees a guy, he's wearing a fisherman's hat, he has a coat on, and she sees him on the phone, at the payphone, uh, at the same time we have the incoming call, which, you know, just might be a coincidence, but then she realizes that she probably is looking at the kidnapper. Of course, what happens, uh, Jerry, is she hears that the call is being terminated and she sees him hang up the phone. Mm. And, then, and then she sees him remove latex gloves. He had transparent latex gloves. And she sees him taking them off each hand, each off the fingers. And she knew that this has to be the kidnapper. So she calls the command post and says, I think I have the kidnapper under surveillance. She gets the license plate of the vehicle, and she did a great job. They told her not to follow him because, you know, we had aerial surveillance, etc. And we immediately find out that the vehicle is a rental vehicle. And it's around uh, 9 o'clock at night now. And the uh, it's, that's, this is why it's great having the local authorities. One of the, uh, uh, the chief of the Morris County Prosecutor's Office knew the owner, of the rental company out in Hackettstown, New Jersey, and got the owner out of her home to open up the records who rented that vehicle. Wow. And, and the agents were at the rental place. Now, here's what happens. Uh, they take me from location to location with the, the um, money to be dropped off. And this was his plan. This was the plan of Arthur Seal to get the money from the kidnapping of Sidney Riso. He was going to put me on a train, and the bags, the money, he had a conversion chart, and he had the bags filled up at how much money would be in each bag. And this was his plan, to get me on a train at a location to drop a bag of money off, knowing that the FBI or surveillance team would have to cut. Somebody would have to stay with that bag of money. They couldn't just abandon it. And his plan was he'll sacrifice a few million dollars to get the bulk of the money and and divide and conquer the FBI surveillance uh, coverage. But as he always did, he had all these grandiose plans, but he could never tie the, the bow on the package. He could never finish it off. And he did not allow enough time for me, running me from each of these locations to catch the train that he wanted me to get on. So <laughs> I was not able to get on that specific train. So then he realized that he had blown it. So he contacted his wife, and they agreed to meet at the rental car company to return the rental cars and his wife to his rental car, and his wife would pick him up in her Mercedes. So what happens is, he goes back to the rental car company. The FBI agents and detectives are there going through the records. As soon as he comes in, they arrest him. And the um, uh, prosecuting attorney of Morris County, because of the exigent circumstances, gave them uh, the uh, opportunity to search the vehicle. And as soon as they opened the trunk, they saw all the duct tape. They saw a list of all the Exxon personnel. They saw the conversion uh, charts. Uh, they saw everything indicating uh, that they were obviously involved in the kidnapping. 
And as luck would have it, shortly thereafter, Jackie Seals, his wife, arrives to pick him up at the scene. We rest her, and then we divided them and interviewed him. He would not say anything. I interviewed her, and I said, look, this family has endured 52 days of hardship, not knowing whether their loved one was dead or alive. Is he dead, or is Sidney Riso alive? And I said, what are we looking at? And she put her head down. And I gently picked up her chin. And I said, are we looking for someone that are alive? And she said, uh, probably dead. And, you know, she knew he was dead, but she wouldn't really con confirm anything at that point. What happens is uh, we had a streak of luck, a break. I interviewed her mother along with another agent on a Sunday night. And her mother was a widow, and she was a, a former nurse. And she said, I did not raise my daughter to be a kidnapper or a murder. She did not like her husband, her, uh, Arthur Seal, her, her daughter's husband. She said, I will, if you get me in to visit my daughter at the jail, I will get my daughter to cooperate. I promise you that. She said, I, I'm an elderly woman. I waited almost five hours and never got into the jail to visit my daughter earlier that day. It was a Sunday afternoon. And I said, we promise you, you'll get in. I called the warden of the jail, told him the circumstances. He said, you tell her to ask for me specifically, and I'll get her in to see her daughter, which he did. And a couple of days later, we got the call that uh, she was ready to cooperate. We interviewed her. We, t we got her out of the jail. We took her to a hotel, to a uh, discreet location, and we interviewed her uh, uh, along with her attorney, uh, who was a female, very ethical, well-prepared uh, attorney, and uh, we reached an agreement that uh, she would plead guilty, she would uh, be sentenced to 20 years, but she would lead us to where the body was buried because we would have never, I don't think, found that body without her leading us to it. He was buried almost a 100 miles away from the, the scene of the kidnapping in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. Wow. And you being from New Jersey, you know that area. Right. Down in South Jersey. And the reason uh, Arthur Seal picked that location, he was familiar with it because he went to a prep school, Admiral Farragut, right down in that area. She was able to take us exactly... Uh, where the body was buried. I said, how can you remember this? She said, because Arthur, I helped him carry the body into this wooded area. She said, I uh, was scared. I wouldn't be able to uh, find him. He did not want me to leave the car on the side of the uh, road because he said the state police patrols that area. And if my car, if the car was seen, they might uh, inquire what, what happened. So he, she had to drive around, and she took made a note of landmarks to find that. So she picked them up about 15 minutes later. He buried off the seal in a uh, kind of a superficial grave. grave. And uh, by the time we came to recover the body, where she showed us the body was buried, uh, there was new uh, growth. And this is the advantage of having a... One of the uh, former homicide, one of the homicide detectives with us, uh, I said, how do you know this is the spot? And she said, I remember this is the area. And he said to me, he says, I think she's right. I said, well, why is that? He said, because if you look, there's grass growing, uh, flowers in this area, and somebody had disturbed it. it was all growing out on an angle. You could see where somebody had stepped on that area when the body was buried. So uh, we got the... Uh, FBI disaster unit in, and for hours they painstakingly dug up the grave not to disturb any evidence, and we found Sidney Riso buried in his, no, just in his boxer shorts, and his wedding ring was on his finger. And that night we returned the wedding ring to his uh, wife, uh, which was very sad to do, but I think it, 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 at least they knew what happened to him. And the wife cooperated. And once the wife cooperated, Arthur Seal uh, was willing to uh, uh, plead guilty. He knew he had no chance of, uh, of, of any, any opportunity. And he tried to write a book about it for profit, but they wouldn't let him, they wouldn't let him do it.
we would have been able to convict him because the FBI lab did a great job. Arthur Seal was very cocky. He always told his wife, he said, if we ever get caught, there's no physical evidence. He always wore gloves. They changed uh, the, the typewriter. They did all kinds of things uh, that they thought would protect them, you know, from any physical evidence. But unbeknownst to them, on the ransom demand letters, the FBI lab identified the hair, bleach blonde hair of, of a woman, turned out to be her hair, uh, the dog hairs, and when I interviewed her, she had a golden retriever. It was the hair of a golden retriever. Mm-hmm. We found fibers on one of the letters that came back to match the fibers of the rental car, burgundy auto carpet that matched identical with the carpet that they transported the body in from the rental car company, which we had seized and searched and and compared the fibers. And then there were fibers from their bedroom carpet that was on one of the communications that was a match, a green and gold carpet. So all these physical things, and then the divers recovered the hardware, the locks and the hinges that he threw into the river. Uh, when he uh, um, uh, disposed of the uh, of the box that they kept Sidney Riso in. That was it. And he was sentenced to a life plus 30 years. And uh, she served her time and was uh, she's uh, out of prison now. I don't know what she's doing, but uh, he's still in prison and uh, was happy that he was uh, never able to profit from uh, writing his book about this uh, uh, kidnapping. And that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, glad to answer them. Yeah, well, one of the things I want to know is what does $18 million in bags look like? Okay, did, well, did you, you have, actually have $18 million? Yes, at one point we had, it was $18.5 million. And that's a great question, Jerry, for this reason. We could not figure out where $18.5 million, the ransom, where that came from. You know, how did he come to that number? And this is an amazing irony. Behavioral Science Unit calls us up on the same day. A good friend of mine who was on the FBI task force, a detective, said, I don't know if this means anything. He said, but I saw an article that was in, in Time magazine in an edition, in the April 4th edition of Time Magazine, 1992, in Colorado, as federal environmental related lawsuit, there was a fine of $18.5 million. And the same day, Behavioral Science Unit calls me up and, and says, you know, we may have come up with the, uh, eight, the, the reason he picked $18.5 million. We saw this article in our research and Time Magazine. So when I interviewed her, I asked her, she said, yes. Yeah. She said, as a family, uh, my son, my daughter, Arthur and myself frequently went to the library. You know, we would get, the kids would get books out. I would get a book out. Arthur was a magazine periodical guy. And she said, he got the idea of the $18.5 million from that Colorado environmental related lawsuit so that that was i thought a pretty interesting uh it, it, it particular situation how they came to that derive that number 18.5 million and physically what does that look like well uh it's 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 enormous it, it filled up a lot of bags uh you know and what kind he, of bags uh he wanted the money uh, specifically in eddie bauer duffel bags he described exactly the size, the type of bag, and we got them. the Eddie Bauer duffel bags. And I forget how many bags it was, but it was a, a number of bags. You know, we wanted the money in the $100 bills and, the, you know, the, the denominations. I, I forget specifically. But she said he had a conversion chart and so figured it out and was willing to sacrifice, a, you know, a several million dollars if he could get his hands on maybe seven, eight million dollars, that, that was, you know, that he was willing to let the rest of it go. Wow. That, that was his plan. Did Mrs. Sill explain to you why they thought 
that he could survive, that, that Riso could survive in a wooden box without any food, how long did they think that they were going to have him in that box? Well, they only thought they were going to have him in there for a couple of days uh, because they had planned, if you remember, uh, the kidnapping was on a Wednesday. They had planned to have the ransom dropped off by Sunday. So they they felt pretty confident that they had these air holes uh, drilled throughout the box, so we had plenty of air holes to breathe through, but they didn't count on the temperature. And that's where they they really misjudged uh, the fact that Sidney Riso's health condition was not that great and that he laid in that wooden box inside that storage facility. And even though they checked him two or three times a day, they gave him water. Uh, they gave him Tylenol for the pain. Uh, the only thing they gave him was some lemon in the water. So that, I mean, when you stop and think about it, the insensitivity it just defies uh, belief, you know, how they could do it. it was, you know, it was just a horrific crime. Wow. Amazing. It's just a very, very sad situation that, yeah, you know, that they put this family through such torment, oh, you know, for, for so cash. It's 52 days uh, without knowing, you know, we knew pretty much you know, because of obviously asking them, uh, to give a photo of uh, Sydney Riso, and they and they wouldn't do that. So we we knew if they wouldn't produce a photo holding it with him holding up the newspaper or reading an article from a, a recent newspaper, that again we were giving them a hurdle they couldn't get over, and that Sydney was probably dead. But you know it's a difficult thing to tell the the family if you don't know for sure. And I mean we felt reasonably sure, but we didn't want them to lose uh, hope either, but realistically, to know that his death was a possibility. During the 52-day period, were you talking to them every day? Every day, yeah. But for the first couple of weeks, we uh, we stayed in their home uh, around the clock. Uh, we, we, we had uh, FBI agents there around the clock, seven days a week. And then we moved the command post over to a... Uh, uh, an off-site location that the prosecutor's office secured, which was much better because it gave us a lot more room to do the uh, investigative things that we needed to do. So you were in touch with the family every day every, for 52 days? Every day, yes. What about the kidnappers? Well, the kidnappers was infrequently, unfortunately, because they dictated when we, we couldn't contact them, so we had to wait to hear from them, whether it be a uh, a letter or uh, one of the phone calls to the uh, number that they had uh, had us use. So there could be a full week that would go by without you hearing from them? Uh, two weeks at, at times. Remember, it was 52 days. So we had a stretch sometimes of like maybe 12 days where we didn't hear from them. And it was, uh, uh, it was very, very difficult. Uh, very, it was very uh, stressful on the family and uh, but again, uh, you know, we stayed the, the unity of the investigative team. The teamwork was great. Uh, everyone worked so well together. Nobody was looking, you know, no agency was looking to steal any headlines. It, I mean, we wanted to get this guy back because the family was such a, you know, nice family. And Exxon couldn't have done more. They they were tremendous in their cooperation and uh, working with us. They did a great job. I guess the, one of the most fortunate things about this investigation was unbelievable greed because after Riso died, he could have just walked away and you may have never solved this. But yes. the fact that that pool, that, that greed to get his hands on millions of dollars made him come back in spite of the fact that the whole plan had fallen apart. That that's exactly the wife had told me she had told him several times abandon this you know forget about it he's dead let's uh, but he knew that that money was out there he knew Exxon had paid fourteen point two million dollars to the Argentina terrorist group and by the way when they released Victor Samuelson you know how they released him they released him on the lawn of a doctor in the Argentina in a wooden box with air holes. Wow. 
So that's where he got that from. Yeah, that's where he got the idea. Again, he was a, a guy who read the articles and researched things and uh, really had a very high opinion of himself. Uh, and, uh, you know, un, un, unfortunately, uh, too high of an opinion of himself. And it led to the death of uh, an innocent man who had such a great reputation. Ed, this has been fascinating. But what's your story? Could you tell us a little bit about when you joined the FBI and, and why you joined the FBI? Sure. Uh, in, in kind of a Reader's Digest version, uh, I wanted to be an FBI agent all through school. I wrote a letter to Cova when I was in high school, and I got a letter back from the FBI. I, I wrote him a letter that I want to be an FBI agent one day. I went to a small college. Uh, you know, the guys knew I always wanted to be an FBI agent. They used to tease me. I went to uh, Jersey City State College, and, you know, friends of mine that I grew up with who, who were my college uh, friends as well, they used to hold their lapel. My one friend said, Ed Peterson, Junior G, man. I said, hey, you <laughs> never know. Someday I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. And uh, I uh, I became a uh, school teacher, went on, got my master's degree, and as luck would have it, I was playing basketball for the New York Athletic Club, and there were three FBI agents involved with the team. They mentored me. I took all the tests, as you remember, in those days we had to take spelling tests and all kinds of tests and passed everything. I got my letter, and in, in June uh, 16th of 1969, I went through training school and uh, loved every minute of it. And uh, I got my first assignment in Tampa, Florida, and then Washington, D.C., and then to New York, and then back home to New Jersey and Newark. And uh, I would have never retired, but I had uh, five uh, children, three in college at one time, and I had a lot of good job offers. And I wound up leaving the FBI and eventually becoming director of security for Major League Baseball for about four and a half years. And then uh, the last almost uh, 20 years, I've uh, uh, run a, um, a, a security consulting and investigative company with a very close friend, the former police commander, who was also administrator with DEA, uh, uh, Jim Buckley. And we've got a great friendship, and uh, we get involved with so many former agents, and it's just a lot of fun. So that's that's what I'm doing now. Well, I want to give you the last word. It could be about this case. It could be about your career. It could be about the state of the FBI today. What would you like to say? Well, um, I, I'm a little disappointed about uh, all the negative publicity. Uh, uh, you know, obviously a lot of mistakes have been made by the Bureau. I hate to see the Bureau get involved in any politics because that was, our, as you know, as a former agent, that was so, so critical to any investigation that we were always independent of any any political leanings whatsoever. And unfortunately, that hasn't happened uh, most recently. And it's really disappointing because I'm in touch with so many agents. We get together about once a month for dinner, about 50, 60 of us. And, uh, and to hear some of the uh, the agents, you know, they're, it's really disheartening, you know, when you, when you read about all the negative things that are happening, unfortunately, and, and you know all the good people that you work with in the FBI and all the good people that work in the FBI now, it's just uh, kind of disheartening to hear. When I reflect upon my career, I could not have had a better job. I would recommend it to anyone because I, it's a job that you know you can do good for others, you can help other people, and that you can look forward to going to work every day. And not a lot of people, as you know, Jerry, can say that in their occupations. Uh, people are making a lot of money, but they're not happy doing what they're doing. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, being an FBI agent, I, I don't think there's a better job. And that's the end of the interview. Back at jerrywilliams.com. You'll find a photo of Ed, and you'll find a number of links to newspaper articles about this case, including a photo of Sidney Russo. I hope you enjoyed the episode and share it with your friends, family, and associates. And don't forget, if you're listening on a podcast app, you can subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review, and every Thursday morning, it will magically appear on your device. My crime fiction recommendation for you this week is not a crime novel, but a crime drama. The Looming Tower is a new miniseries, 10 episodes, on Hulu, based on the book by the same name by Lawrence Wright. 
plot traces the rising threat of Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda and takes a controversial look at how the rivalry between the FBI and the CIA inadvertently may have set the stage for the tragedy of 9-11 and the war in Iraq. The series portrays real-life FBI agent John O'Neill, who is in charge of the FBI's counterintelligence unit. When O'Neill retired from the FBI in early 2001, he became the head of security for the World Trade Center and tragically died at the age of 49 in the collapse of the North Tower on 9-11. Now, I'll confess that I'm recommending this miniseries, even though I haven't seen it yet. But I have read that agents who have had a chance to watch the first two or three episodes believe that it is accurate and portrays the FBI agents well. I am working on interviewing one of those agents, and I hope to have that episode for you sometime in April. So my crime fiction, crime drama recommendation for you is The Looming Towers, available now on the streaming service Hulu. And one last reminder for you to check out my crime thriller, Pay to Play, about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. Pay to Play is available as an ebook, trade paperback, or audiobook at Amazon.com. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetire.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you. Thank you.